Hello. Okay. Just give me a second while I um, remind myself what I'm talking about her day and hopefully click the right button, which would uh, help. Okay, okay, uh, there we go. So, um, for those of you that don't know me, that's who I am. I'm uh, Claire, Claire Tupling. Um, I'm a sociologist by trade. And I'm a senior lecturer um, in education at the college, in the College of Arts, Humanities and Education at the U University of Derby. Um, as a lecturer, um, you can imagine that I do quite a lot of talking in my work, so a lot of teaching, a lot of presentations, um, supervising the doctoral students, um, anyone who works in academia will know you have to go to lots of meetings, um, some of which can be exciting. Um, and there's also making phone calls. I work with a lot of part-time students, a lot of students that don't come onto campus. So the only way that you can communicate with them is uh, via Skype or telephone calls. So there's quite a lot of speaking that I do in my job and um, I also have a st st stammer um, um, so as well as kind of spending most of the day talking um, there are some other, other more mundane activities like admin that don't involve a lot, lot of speaking but it's actually the speaking part of my job that I enjoy the most I don't know many academics that enjoy the uh, paperwork but perhaps there's some uh, so just by way of orientating ourselves to what I'm going to talk about in this presentation, I'll just say briefly, this is a kind of a navigation, a guide to what I'm talking about, so you know what to expect. So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and my research and where, where that research came from, that additional labour of uh, academics who stammer. Um, then I'm going to go on to link to our conference theme and consider what we mean by uh, silence on campus. Um, and I will consider then, as a part of that, the reasons uh, and the consequences for declaring yourself as to be a disabled ac academic or an academic with, uh, with a disability. I'm then, I'm then going to look at some initial findings from my research that's ongoing. Um, about the experiences of academics who start, including my own experiences, how that fits in as well. Um, and finally, actually, this presentation is going to serve as a recruiting platform if anybody wants to um, volunteer to be part of my research. Um, um, they can, I've got my contact details at the end, or you can just speak to me. So, this is a research study that I'm currently involved in. So it's experiences of managing fluency and disfluency amongst higher education lecturers who stammer. That term lecture is quite broad because there are some lecturers that don't do a lot of teaching, even though they're called a lecturer. Uh, there's researchers and there's also a PhD students who might do a bit of teaching as part of their studies. Um, so this research didn't just come out of nowhere. I didn't just wake up one morning and think, oh, well, this would be interesting to research. Um, so it's been shaped by my own experiences of uh, being a lecturer who, lecturer who stammers and who's had to navigate some of the challenges in that workplace um, as a consequence. So briefly about myself, I've been teaching since 2004, which seems like... A lifetime ago, um, in, so mainly in social sciences and education. So these are uh, disciplines that require a lot of dis discussion. Um, I hope I've been doing that job successfully. Um, I probably wouldn't still be in it if I wasn't that su successful. My stammer has been an ever present during this time. It's caused me um, to kind of question my ability or suitability for the job or whether I'd be accepted in the job. It's caused me anxiety about, you know, whether I can maintain the speaking responsibilities that I've got. Um, but even though it's been ever-present, it's never really prevented me from doing the 
job, have been doing it since 2004. Um, I found that mostly students don't care. Um, and if they do care initially, if they are bothered about it initially, that really soon wear, wears off. Um, but there's, but there's, there's still that ang anxiety. So I, I feel as though I have to sound good, I have to sound right in order to make a good, a good impression. And we know from research studies that students report that um, a presentation that is more fluent, they rate that as better than a presentation that um, contains some non-fluencies or disfluencies, even though the content be that is being presented is the same. Um, I'm expected to go to meetings and be articulate. I'm expected to make phone calls and have those or, or other oral communications. Um, so there is this, am I performing well enough? I, you know, am I satisfying my students? Because that's a big concern in higher education. Is, are students getting what they're paying for? Um, in my current role, things have changed quite considerably in the last few years. Um, and I think that has come mainly because I, instead of retreating from my stammer and kind of hiding it and not really talking about it, um, I've accepted that it's there and I've had to do something to kind of make life a little bit easier for me in my role. Um, so as a sociologist, I'm trained to kind of think beyond myself and look at the sort of wider social co context and um, to find some kind of conceptual and theoretical um, approaches to understanding my experiences and those of other academics who... <laughs> Who stammer, and in the course of becoming more interested in um, the experience of somebody who stammers in higher education as a lecturer, um, it turns out there are there are other academics who who stammer. We've heard from some of them today, and there's a, there's at least two of us in my my college. Um, so the title of the conference then is Silence on. K K campus and Claire invited us to make a noise about stammering um, so I'm just going to go through some thoughts about what we what we might mean by silence on campus and these aren't this isn't a definitive um, um, understanding it's just some things that you know I think are quite interesting to think about so uh, writers like St. Pierre and Chris Eagle talk about how stammering, uh, disfluency, has been largely absent from dis disability studies. And they are making attempts to kind of relocate stammering within disability studies. Now, um, disability studies fits within the social sciences and the, and the humanities, and it offers a way of understanding um, the way that disability is socially constructed. Um, so regardless of whether one thinks of stammering as a disability, the um, approach is a perspective of disability studies offers a way of un understanding st stammering. So it's been silenced because actually academia has not really talked about, about, about stammering. Um, studies with People at Stammer has shown that disfluency is the greatest impact in the workplace. And similarly, um, uh, Klein, and Ho Klein and Hood's research um, showed that um, people at Stammer felt that their disfluency negatively impacted on their job, their job performance. So why would you want to talk about it if you think that uh, stammering is a, di is, is, is a deficiency. So if you don't talk about it, you're silencing, you're silencing st st stammering. And Claire Butler's work um, has shown that um, in workplaces that there is an expectation to sound right. So why declare yourself to be a st somebody who st stammers? Um, you wouldn't want to talk about it. So this is about silence. This is how stammering 
become silent on campus. Um, however, we also know from other research, so um, John Horton and Faith Tucker um, looked at uh, disabled academics in, in geography. And they suggest that the academic workplace is, is frequently a place that constructs somebody's disablement. So it's a very significant context if you're, if you're in academia. And so their participants felt um, that they became defined by their disability and that they were excluded uh, uh, by their disability. Particular, you know, it, it had impacts for their teaching, it had impacts for their research, and had impacts on their career development. At the same time, um, academic, uh, disabled academic members of staff often declared themselves to be disabled as a kind of an activist position. Um, which isn't a straightforward. So we, we could do that. Disabled ac academics could do that. Um, so there is this theory, uh, Giddens, um, it's very simply put, I'm not going to go into it in any great detail, we haven't got the time and uh, so on. So uh, there's this idea that we construct our own identity. We're active in, in choosing um, who we are, our, our identities. Um, and so, therefore, the identifying as a disabled academic may be uh, a choice, and it may be an assertive choice, and that you, you might be making um, a statement of solidarity or making an assertion of a right to be treated in a particular way or the right not to be di discriminated. But it can also be risky. Um, and it, there's some research that I did, a paper that I wrote with my colleague Deb Althwaite, where I talk about um, how I came to declare myself as, a, as, a, as an academic with a, a disability. Um, and this was in quite difficult circumstances, which I aren't going to go into. Um, so there was a choice there. I chose to do it. It was a statement. It was kind of an assertive move to make. But the circumstances had, had, had kind of forced me into that position. And it was also, in some ways, even that you know, everybody knew that I stammered. I couldn't hide it. I'm not capable of, of uh, hiding it. So that choice isn't always uh, uh, there. So if, I, if we turn to um, some of the experiences of... Um, academics that I spoke to that stammer. I've described them as accidental ac academics. I don't think this is unique to people that's, that stammer. I think it's common in higher education that people come into higher education when they didn't plan to, through changes of circumstances. Um, but I think some of the ways that people who stammer talk about their role in academia, it's almost as if they're waiting to be found out. They then it's, it's um, a little bit uncomfortable there. Um, so some of the people I've spoken to talked about how they um, had self-imposed career limitations. Um, so opting to do a job or follow a degree course that involved no speaking, but then finding themselves in, ac in academia and then realising that they did have skills in communication um, um, and how then the stammering became less of an issue or it became less disabling. There's also those uh, people that stammer that once in academia decided that's where they wanted to stay just in, in lecturing roles that didn't want to pursue uh, leadership roles because they felt there'd be too much... Um, they wouldn't be capable or they wouldn't be taken seriously in a leadership role or a management role because of their stammer. Um, and there's also the additional labour that is quite interesting. So one lecturer talked to me about how, in addition to their lectures that they would produce, they wrote a transcript of every lecture that they did and made that available to students. 
and they did that, not because they were asked to, but because they felt that if they didn't, they would be disadvantaging the student. And I, no other lecturer was expected to do that. Um, so it was the extra work, you know, instead of um, just giving an a oral presentation, they would also write a paper to accompany that. In terms of my own experiences of additional labour, it was the extra time and effort that I had to make to arrange tutorials um, by Skype or to make phone calls. It meant that I was having to book rooms that were empty or somewhere that was quiet where I could go and make phone calls and have these Skype conversations. And it just became unsustainable because you'd have to wait three weeks before a room became available in, in, in academia. Everybody's booking rooms. There just isn't enough space. Um, so since I came out in... As, as a um, as as a academic who who stammers and was disabled and um, um, keen to find a way of getting through it, um, things have changed for me. And I've called this slide "Train Your Chair." It could be "Tame Your Your uh, Chair." So this is kind of really relates to my own experiences of how I've managed to kind of change my uh, circumstances at work. Um, so one of my challenges was talk is talking at meetings. Now, some of the more formal meetings, very perversely, are easier to access because they're bigger. It's a university-wide committee. Um, there's very, it's very procedural. The space is where you are expected to speak places on the agenda where you are expected to speak. Uh, so you stick your hand up to the chair and that's a very effective way of managing it. Some of the more, some of the less formal meetings are actually more difficult for me to access because people just chipped in. So I now manage that by um, telling the chair in advance where I want to contribute to and he then has the responsibility of inviting me in to speak. It means I have to do extra work because I have to read all the papers, you know, a week or two in advance and prepare my response. But what it does is, is demonstrate my ability and it allows me to um, effectively contribute in a way that I wasn't doing, that I wasn't doing before. So it actually demonstrates, uh, so it isn't just the university being kind, it isn't just my boss being, being kind, I've actually demonstrated that those strategies work. And because I'm contributing more, um, I'm challenging that superiority of fluency. It's very common for me to go to a meeting and stammer. I can't say my name fluently at introductions, and now everybody else, I think, is, is now kind of um, content with that. So I think as, as academics at STAM, I think we have a responsibility to assert your right to, to, to stammer. And my final uh, point is um, this research is uh, ongoing. Um, uh, I would welcome any other ac academics, whether they be lecturers, PhD students, uh, researchers, etc., who would be willing to be interviewed as a part of this research um, and those that's my e e email address thank you oh we've got a couple of pages of references if you're really geeky and you want to know them so thank you